Okay. Fine. Let's uh, let's pray. Then we'll get... Father, we thank you, Lord. We thank you for the wisdom that's in your word, Lord. We thank you for, Lord, giving us your word, Master. We thank you for the Holy Spirit, the work of the Holy Spirit in expo in uh, or expounding, O oh God, and uh, Lord, shedding light on, Lord, everything that is in your word, Master. We thank you for, Lord, you are our teacher. We thank you, Lord, you are the one who leads us and guides us into all truth. And uh, yes, Lord, even this morning, we ask, Lord, even as we come at this day into your mighty hands, we pray that, uh, Spirit of God, that you will continue to lead us, that you'll continue to speak to us. And um, yes, Lord, lead us into all truth, Father God, and establish us in the present truth, Master. Yes, Lord, let there be a revelation of uh, God, the truth uh, in each one of our hearts, Father God. And I just pray that um, every lie will be replaced by the truth. Lord, every fear will be replaced with the truth, oh God. Master, we pray that, um, Lord, even as you do that, Lord, that our lives will change, that uh, there will be transformation, Lord, in our thinking, in our um, in our behavior, and in our lifestyle, Lord. And uh, I just pray, Father God, that uh, that we will, Lord, uh, uh, we will, Lord, glorify you, God, that your name will be glorified, that we will reflect your glory, Lord, in all the every day and everything that we put our hands to, God. Lord, and uh, yes, Master, we commit ourselves into your mighty hands. You lead us, you guide us. In Jesus' master's name, we pray. Amen. Amen. Okay, so um, we are in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, right? Uh, so last class, we looked at um, the first part of it, um, verse 22, sorry, uh, 16 verses, where uh, Paul writes about spiritual covering authority divine order um, that he has uh, that god has set up and so he talks about that and also addresses a cultural um, issue that the corinthian church is facing so while addressing that we you know we, uh, we made mention of the fact that you know we need to make a distinction between what is scriptural truth which is eternal which does not change and what is tradition and what is uh, something that we can call as cultural which will be for a particular period, for a particular group of people. So we need to make that distinction. We need to understand that. Right? So in addressing that cultural issue, Paul actually also gives a revelation of the, uh, the eternal perspective of uh, divine order and spiritual covering, etc. Right. So, um, so that is uh, how, uh, and with regard to the cultural aspect of you know, head covering, um, Paul says uh, in verse 15 or verse 16 that uh, you know there is there is no such custom uh, in the there is no such a thing that we have in the churches of God. That's how we end, that, that's how we end it, right? So today let's look at um, uh, the second part of it, which is uh, uh, about the Lord's Supper. Let me just share the notes. Um, or the Lord's table, or what we call as Holy Communion, right? So. Um, so there was there was an issue in the Corinthian church about that as well. Okay, so let's uh, read from yeah um, verse seventeen, right? Yeah, I'm sorry. Um, you have a question before we? You have a doubt now? You have a doubt? Do you have a question? Oh, okay, okay. No, I'll, I'll just read through. Yeah, sure. Um, so, verse 17, okay, now in giving these instructions, I do not praise you, since you come together, not for the better, but for the worse. Uh, for first of all, when you come together as a church, I hear that there are divisions among you, and in part I believe it, for there must also be factions among you, that those who are approved may be recognized among you. Therefore, when you come together in one place, it is not to eat the Lord's Supper, for in eating, one, each one takes his own supper ahead of others. And one is hungry, the other is drunk. You know, what do you not have houses to eat and drink in? Do you or do you despise the church of God and shame those who have nothing? What shall I say to you? Shall I praise you in this? I do not praise you. For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take eat, this is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. 
in the same manner he also took the cup after supper saying this cup is the new covenant in my blood this do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me for as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup you proclaim the lord's death till he comes therefore whoever eats this bread or drinks this cup of the lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of the body and blood of the lord but let a man examine himself and so let him eat of the bread and drink from the cup for he who eats and drinks um just one second sorry yeah for he eat uh, he eats and drinks in an unworthy manner eats and drinks judgment to himself not discerning the lord's body for this reason many are weak and sick among you and many sleep for if we would judge ourselves we would not be judged and but when we are judged we are chastened by the lord that we may not be condemned with the world therefore my brethren when you come together to eat wait for one another but if anyone is hungry let him eat at home lest you come together for judgment and the rest i will set in order when i come okay so he's um, here in this uh, passage paul is addressing one important aspect which is the lord's table um, what all what is called as the lord's supper or what is called as holy communion right so this was so from this we understand that the church had this practice every time we gather they gathered together they had this breaking of bread they had this uh, holy communion uh, so that is something that we understand which was a practice in the early church but here there was a problem in the corinthian church saying that they came together and instead of understanding why they were doing it right they were instead of uh, understanding the the significance the spiritual significance of why they were doing it it became more like a general social gathering with a kind of a feasting right so they were eating and drinking and all that so as a result of that paul says you know this uh, in the, the he says there, there was something happening uh, to them he says many are sick and also you're actually if you're doing this in an unworthy manner you are eating and drinking judgment to yourself right um so we need to examine oneself so um you know if you look at uh, what is the purpose right he's setting in order what is the purpose of the lord's table first of all he goes on to say you know this is something a revelation that i received directly from the lord right so this is something that you need to do and then we see in the book of acts also that the wherever the uh, the believers gathered they did this right they followed in the apostles doctrine and in the breaking of the bread and so on that's what we see acts chapter 3 and and so on so this was followed and so here the disciples continued to share the gospel continued to establish churches and continued this aspect of the sacrament of the church they did that but here he's he's actually telling him telling them why we are doing it you know there seems to be the you seem, seem to have lost that focus or lost uh, the reason why we are doing it so he's ask he's sharing the, uh, with them about what the lord actually said and this is what it means that the body is this symbolic of his body and the blood it's the blood of the new covenant and the sacrifice and so on so um you are actually proclaiming declaring what jesus did on the cross right you're you're remembering you're proclaiming okay this is what jesus did you're remembering about salvation <clears throat> remembering that great transaction that happened um you know sin sickness curse everything was taken on the cross the body of sin was you know uh, destroyed forever uh, and new life salvation healing wholeness blessing of abraham released into your um life right so into into, into our life so that is something that we are over and over again we are reminding ourselves as a as a church when we gather together so he tells them this is the purpose this is what we are doing so you cannot dishonor this right it's a sacred moment it's a victorious moment no wonder you know it's a it's a time to rejoice because you are 
you know, you're declaring that you are a new creation. You're declaring that you are blessed instead of being cursed. You're declaring that the blessing of Abraham has come upon you and all that. So it's a it's a time to rejoice as well. But it's it's not a time to uh, you know take that focus off, take the reverence off, and just focus on. Uh, so the early church actually got together and had a meal. You know, it was a small gathering, right? House churches or wherever they were meeting. So it they could have that. They could have a meal and then they could do this. So, um, so he's uh, kind of correcting that and is rebuking them. Right? If you look at verse twenty-seven, right, he talks about um, it's a grave warning. You know, he says, "Whoever eats this bread or drinks the cup in an unworthy manner will be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord." Okay, so what is this unworthy manner? Not discerning, he says, not discerning the Lord's body. So you lose, you, you kind of lose the focus, you lose the meaning of why we are doing this, right? Maybe it just come down to a ritual. Maybe it is something there where you don't understand why we are doing what we are doing. And so he says, you are actually doing it in, in, in an unworthy manner. And therefore, you're guilty. You come under guilt. And what else does he say? He says, if you're eating in an unworthy manner, you're, you're eating and drinking judgment to yourself. And what kind of judgment? For this reason, he says, many are weak and sick and many sleep. Okay, so instead of actually receiving the blessing that is available freely given because of the cross, you are not partaking of that. Yeah, you're not actually appropriating the finished work of the cross. So that is what he's saying. Now, this is what was given. This is what is freely available. But in your ignorance or willful disobedience of um, treating this irreverently, you are not actually appropriating what is given for you, what is freely given for you. Right? Because when you're proclaiming, you're proclaiming the cross. You're proclaiming the grace that is available. You're proclaiming that all that scriptural truth, spiritual truth, but here, because of ignorance or willful disobedience, you're not appropriating. So he's saying many are weak, many are sick, and even some sleep, meaning, you know, it's, it's, when he says sleep, he's talking about death. Right? Physically, some are, some are succumbing to their uh, you know, diseases and sicknesses, and they are uh, dying. Right? So, so, he, so he says that, you know, you need to judge yourself. You need to change this. And, and really take part in a worthy manner, in a reverential manner, and therefore walk in the blessing that is meant to be. Okay? Because if you, if you look at um, uh, the previous chapter, 1 Corinthians 10, and um, if you look at verse 16, right? so there also he talks about communion. While talking about idolatry, while talking about the table of the demons, and he calls it the table of the Lord and, and uh, table of demons, uh, worship, idol worship and all that. So there he talks about the, uh, you know, the cup of blessing. You know, he's saying it's a cup of blessing, verse 16, chapter 10, verse 16. Right? And he's talking about the bread. We all partake of that one bread or one body. Uh, this is what we partake of. It's talking about the body of Christ. We are, you know, we are, um, we are declaring that we are part of His body. So, whatever the blessing, whatever, you know, the the spiritual, uh, I don't know, what do you, what can you say? You know, the Zoe God kind of life that is there in Christ is what you're partaking of. You're partnering with. You know, you're 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 actually receiving from that. Right. So that's the significance of it, and therefore. The Lord has instituted the saying, you do it till I come. Right? So the intention of the Lord in proclaiming the death, burial, and resurrection through this is for us to walk in blessing, is for us to walk in health. Right? So, so Paul says, you know, you're not appropriating it because you're not understanding, you're doing it in an unworthy manner. So therefore, the reverse of it, which is judgment, right? the reverse is what is happening in some of your lives because of so he's saying you examine yourself you change it and uh, you know don't cause it to be trivial and so on
And if you look at the first part of it, what we say is, you know, again, is addressing the whole thing of division. Okay, there are division. Uh, there are some people who want prominence among you, um, meaning that you want to be treated highly, respected, even as you come together. Right, uh, this is saying that there might be factions, verse 19, and those who are that those who are approved may be recognized among you. You know, you're just craving for recognition and approval and and all that. So, and and therefore, the whole thing of the Lord's table is losing its relevance. So he's making that correction there. Okay. Um. Yeah. A any questions here? Chapter 11. I think it's pretty uh, straightforward, right? And um, and maybe if there were any question about okay, drinking judgment upon yourself, it's like you know we when we read it in context with verse sorry chapter ten, then we understand that it's meant to bring in blessing, and it's meant to um, you know uh, bring in victory, bring bring in health and healing and wholeness, but you're not appropriating it, you're not receiving it, you're not walking in it. Right, so yeah. Any, you have a question? Okay. So, uh, so, Pastor, like uh, we know, like we can do it as many times as it want, and it's also be taken. Like we can also take part in Lord's Supper at our homes by our own self, like without any a priest or pastor giving it, but many people don't accept for it and also most people like when we see in the context they are like we know like what unworthy manner means here but also but in some certain churches in some certain places for them taking unworthy is like you sinning and coming and taking part of the lord's table that's why so it will be like that and also especially like when it comes to women also, when they were in their uh, periods time, they won't even come to church, they won't even come and partake because they think they are in a time of unclean. So how we can take it like that is not contact, this is the truth. Yeah, so the thing is, you know, what does the cross signify? What does the death, burial and resurrection of the Lord bring about? You know, the first part of what you said, what you asked, it's obviously, Forgiveness, healing, and wholeness. Right? So that is it. So if a person is, you know, is maybe he has committed acts of sin, right? So the best place for that person is, is to come back to the cross and receive what the Lord actually demonstrated or what the Lord is extending through the finished work of the cross. That's the best place. So Yes, some you know, in all sincerity, when when people say, "Okay, if you you know if you've sinned, uh, then it's it's wrong to say don't take part." Right? It is it is right to say you know repent, understand that because of grace and the mercy is available for you because of the cross, and therefore as you take part, you know you receive of that grace and mercy, right? and repent and walk in victory. So that would be the right way to minister or share about communion to someone who has you know, maybe committed acts of acts of sin. Okay. But if someone is walking in willful sin, let's say, you know, even in the Corinthian church, there was someone, right? So he's walking in willful sin, meaning it's part of the lifestyle, um, you know, that that person does not want to, does not want to change in any way. You know, here we see that people had approached. This particular person, right? We read about uh, in the earlier chapters that. So there, he's saying, you know, you purge out the leaven so that it does not, you know, uh, kind of, um, uh, you know, the others also do not become affected by that. So that is one one thing that is also true. That is the fact if somebody is walking in willful sin. But see, as a minister or as a pastor, as a servant, as a leader, now we don't have a right to stop that person from taking part in communion. So the right way to do it is you, know, you repent, you get right before God. Here is another moment for you to get right with God. 
here is another opportunity for you to come back to him change your ways and this is what is available for you and therefore you do it so that would be the that would be the right way perspective about the class uh so i won't you know i'm unholy i'm unworthy to take part in the communion that is the yeah yeah so that is that defeats the whole purpose of what communion is about like saying okay i'll set right which means something to do with my works i will set right i will walk in holiness for a season and then i will take part in the communion now that defeats the whole purpose of what the cross has accomplished for us it's not that you would become holy apart from the cross and then come and you know um, as if you are telling the lord lord now i am holy therefore i am worthy enough to take part in the communion no the lord is is putting it the other way hey you are not you are not holy you are not worthy come to the cross and let me make that change you know receive of what i had actually bought for you on the cross and let that change you right? that's that's the declaration of the cross right? you have a question uh-huh. so pastor like when it's coming to the elements of the communion yeah. so is it mandated to make from the raw element like um kind of like wheat or the raw grape is it mandatory to make from that or we can purchase like something already made yes uh should it be uh, bread and wine yes it as they had in the last supper okay. um <laughs> i i really don't know but we know that it's the see the physical element you know it's symbolic and i'm sure when you look into it why it is bread there are references to what uh, the lord jesus did for us on the cross and so you know when you drink of the cup also it is the blood in the new covenant which is referring to right so well one can be strict enough and say okay this is uh, you know i i'd like to do it this way but if not also it is equally powerful it is equally let's say effective does not lose its significance and power because you are using something else right of what is available um yeah that is what that is my opinion actually yeah it's not scripture that is my opinion i feel that it does not does not take away the power or the significance of what we are doing yeah like i have a word from people they sometimes take biscuit and water hmm okay or hmm so biscuit and water and i know you know during covid time whatever was there you know you didn't uh, probably have it was just you know uh, just water was basic thing that was available and then yeah so it was so yeah that's what so it does not take away the significance it does, does not take away the power of what you're doing because it's a symbolic act the earthly elements are pointing to something else so so that is what it is so i haven't really studied too much into that you know the the earthly elements the physical part of it um yeah so that is what i would say yeah um, any other Oh, uh, pastor. So, yeah, uh, we see here like uh, they whenever they used to meet, they used to uh, did that Lord's supper. And uh, when I came here, I saw here that every Sunday we are uh, doing this communion right. elements. But in my place, like people is keeping like uh, once a month. They'll do once a first Sunday a month. Oh. I, like first week or last week. Okay. So, is it okay to keep like this schedule or? Uh, yeah so the typically you know we can actually do it whenever you know as often as we meet is what the lord says so we can do it for purpose of logistical purposes you know if the church is big and uh, you know they used to have it once once a month i think some of the mainland churches have it maybe once sunday or i i don't know what they miss one sunday i think third sunday they don't have or something like that so it's it's fine 
you know e even actually you know in a year if you see we used to have it only one sunday in a month uh, uh when we started off and then we said okay let's let's do it every sunday every time we meet etc so it's it's fine it is uh, because especially when you you know you can meet in your home we can do that and uh, and actually our uh declaring the finished work of the cross uh many times even through the you know through the worship service itself right uh, maybe through the song maybe during the you know time of prayer uh, we are we will be you know we will see that it is actually you know, we are proclaiming we are declaring though we are not actually taking part in the lord's table right we are proclaiming it so in that sense yeah the lord's the, the finished work of the cross is being proclaimed throughout every time we meet right but maybe for logistical administrative purposes this these things could happen and yeah it is fine yeah, yeah. um pastor um, it's also said right uh, whenever they gathered or uh, they broke the bread and uh, they fellowshiped together yeah uh, does that imply to that uh, fact where whenever we gather as a, a church or believers uh we break the bread of god i mean the communion basically uh, doesn't matter how many times it can be a, every day uh, it can be every day right yeah so the frequency of it can be you know whenever uh, but is it something that is mandated by the lord you know if you if you like for example if you're not doing it then you're actually disobeying or living in sin or something like that you know that is that is the bigger you know issue right so the thing is we have freedom we have freedom to do it um you know as we gather we have freedom to do it uh, whenever we uh, whenever we meet for the purpose of worship corporately or maybe you know even individually or maybe as uh, uh, you know as a small family you know in our own homes we have the freedom to do this knowing that this is what we are declaring so yeah absolutely that's fine you have a question or oh, that one about about meeting in individually and yeah 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 but uh, uh corporately when we do we are saying that you know when we we are part of that one bread though we are many uh, so uh, like uh, that is what the uh, one Corinthians 10 talks about that right though we are part of that one bread though we are many so uh, it has its significance when we are taking part corporately as well but personally yes personally also yeah we are proclaiming this declaring this truth yeah it's fine i i know of people who take every day who do this yeah um and uh, also probably with the going through some illness or you know they just contending for um, healing and wholeness breakthrough in that and they do it every day yeah okay any any other questions okay uh, I think just one second. Uh, so Nina, yeah, yeah, Nina, go ahead. Uh, uh, to ask about the uh, the law, I mean the problems that were taking place in the Corinthian church uh, yeah. about the uh, drinking and whatever the uh, yeah, it says eating and drinking. Yeah, mm. drinking. Yeah, so were they were it? There was supposed to be some kind of meal that would be there before the actual uh, uh, partaking of the Lord's supper. And was it because it's saying that uh, um, some of you one remains hungry, another gets drunk. Mm. So each of you go, each of you goes ahead without waiting for anybody. Yeah, so that that they are really talking about the kind of a feast that they would have in connection with the Lord's Supper. I mean, that was what was happening. That I think that used to lead to the Lord's Supper. And yeah. So from what be... we see, yeah, from what we see, like especially verses 20, 21, 22, um, where Paul says, you know, don't you have your own houses? Do you not yeah. have your houses to eat and drink in, etc.? So, which means that they were gathering together and they had something, something like a fellowship meal. Yeah. That is, uh, that is what we see, and uh, uh, and probably, like you said, you know, maybe they had the Lord's Supper. And then it led to the fellowship meal or the other way around, whatever. Around. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But it was the Lord's table was losing its significance. Its significance, yes. In all this. So, yeah. So that is why he had to say, you know, you have your own houses to eat and drink. 
and then okay. you know and even in that it having part of that meal it's like somebody some people are you know not even considering the others uh, while eating and then you know they so that one is going hungry the other one is you know so um, so something like that was also happening so also is that happening. Oh, yeah all those multiple things and um, yeah so in most most of these places uh, like when we when churches uh, especially in home house churches um, there is some sort of a fellowship meal you know that happens and even some some of the brethren churches they still do right they have the service and then everybody stays back anybody from the brethren assembly uh, uh but they used to meet and uh okay okay oh that communion okay okay no i'm just talking about the meal that uh, most of these brethren churches also they they stay back they cook they eat the entire church does that so so obviously yeah it's a whole uh, they have the lunch uh, on a sunday uh then other church so so something like that was happening here obviously and so in that also they were not mindful of you know whether the other person had enough to eat so that was also something that is addressing and uh, yes definitely uh, yeah um, what was not in place is the significance of the lord's table yeah okay uh this a uh, reference to also about many of you um, uh, among you as weak and sick yeah so when when we don't uh, partake without recognizing is that also something that will um be a, i mean it will be a consequence of uh, not partaking properly yeah, yeah. so two things to physical sickness also right right so two things to consider there one is that one is you know um willfully or you know ignoring the significance of it and therefore they are opening doors for you know all kinds of these things happening because they are you know they are uh, willfully um, uh, i mean they they're doing it irreverently uh, so not discerning the lord's body is, is is how he puts it right so so that is kind of opening the door um the second thing is that what actually the cross signifies and what is actually available for us when we are not appropriating it right so when the the lord's table is actually an opportunity for us by faith to receive to appropriate what has already been freely given to us right so in not making use of that opportunity many are weak and sick and also some sleep right so so it could it's it's both those things put together uh, is what he's saying right so you're drinking judgment upon yourself where 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 it is actually supposed to be uh, something that uh um, brings blessing into your life and all the finished work of Jesus on the cross you know you, it is for us um to receive by grace and faith to walk in but we are not doing it we are missing out on it because it's done in an unworthy manner yeah uh one more thing pastor about yeah. the co covering of the head uh, situation yeah, yeah. Pastor, while there are i mean those many churches who have the right uh teaching about it that was um, almost entirely a cultural thing which was related to yeah. the, the Corinthian times uh but there are many who denominations who still follow it right you know, the external yeah. covering of the head so yeah. while we uh, i mean i think last time when we talked we did we did say that yeah we need to tell them i mean so in that process i think when mm. the discussion came they said then i mean i don't think they're willing to really listen uh, yeah. because they consider it a timeless instruction okay he said okay you cover because at that time of course i don't know they probably don't go into the thing that that time all women covered their head in public spaces also i think no right. that is that is what right. it was all so when they did uh, so when they didn't it meant that it meant something bad either they were immoral right. or they were flaunting their independence so that right. doesn't apply to us today but mm -hmm. still since they cover uh, certain places if the culture of that place yeah. say in the north sometimes if it yeah. is to kind of cover the head 
so mm-hmm. maybe it's uh, okay to conform i mean say okay but not to make an issue there is it okay to i mean say okay i mean if if that is so important to you we'll yeah. do it while on the other hand try and make them understand from scripture slowly i mean if that's taking time because these things sometimes they're very rigid about these things right. and they feel it's it's a kind of uh, like okay we are talking about modesty or whatever i mean there may be so many things that they may be talking about Mm. So is it okay to you know say go along and say okay we do it your way but at the same time try and see how they can understand from scripture that it is not really significant in the way they understand but to conform yeah. what i was trying to ask is it's okay to conform without really you know making an issue out of it right right yeah definitely you know you respect the culture you respect the tradition of that place uh mm-hmm. and uh, like in fact we also tell our you know the, uh, when we go in a mission trip and we tell our women also you know you cover your head you know because that's what they do over there so you please you know uh-huh. if you're going to be preaching if you're going to be sharing you please you know if you're wearing a dupatta or something you just cover your head and do it because that's yeah. what they're comfortable with so absolutely okay but um but we need to uh kind of make the distinction if it comes up you know if it comes yeah. up that the truth of god's word the eternal truth of god's word there is no command you know by yeah. covering or uncovering you are not really uh, you know uh, yeah there's no command there there's no so that is that distinction if it comes up for discussion to share that mm-hmm. but as a custom as a culture if you know if it signifies something and uh, you know this is what you're comfortable with i think yeah we just need to respect that and do that right simple yes. thing like footwear you know in in removing our f- shoes or footwear uh things like that is absolutely i think it's important to do that in order to build a bridge and uh, like uh, we uh, we we'll also hear about uh, culturally sensitive churches right um, especially among the islamic community where everybody sits down and everybody comes in their you know hijab and all that and uh, so um, yeah so it's it's important to do that and we'll be even more effective uh, yeah. to keep the main things you know focus on the main things rather on the secondary issues so where where more people actually come to the truth that way yeah but we need to be kind of sensitive divide we don't yeah. compromise uh, com- don't compromise on the truth like you know what yes. happens is in a in a bid to be relevant uh, ah. more and more re- relevant and to win as many as possible we sometimes people compromise on the truth yeah that's that is if we can avoid that that's the you know that's the thing that that should be our safeguard yeah yes yes pastor yeah. thank you sure yeah 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 so the question is at what age can we give communion so the traditional church decided on one age right if you see the, okay the, uh, they said okay after passing 10 standard or something like that you know you yeah taking it in a worthy manner it's like being conscious of conscious. the work of the cross being awareness yeah being aware being a believer first yeah. first of all being a believer having received jesus understood salvation experienced salvation and so so at what age does that person do it you know so that's the thing so which means that uh, we can't have a blanket thing saying okay everybody 10 years and about do it no we need to make sure that this is what so it becomes a little sensitive thing because what if you have a child who's not a believer you know and then child sees everybody doing <laughs> doing it and says i even i want to do so things to explain to the child and say okay this is you know uh, yeah mm mm they will give uh yeah infant baptism and uh ah, yeah yes yeah same here so so they, it's just that uh, they do it with the awareness of what it means and for you know for a small child can be a believer you don't need to complicate things say this is what jesus did this is what you can receive so do it you know so uh with the innocence and everything they will take part uh, reverently um but they just just need to make sure that they understand 
why they're doing it yeah so like in, in fact i've had conversation with another uh, parents where they really uh, they wanted their child to take part in baptism water baptism then i just kind of spoke to them you know you why don't you uh, why is, why does he want to do it because because he's seen his brother do it and all that and then uh, you know but he also wants to but then said okay um, and this just this, this boy understands you know said you just make sure because you don't want to have a situation where the child grows up and maybe in his 20s he's saying hey my uh, you know i did it but uh, that time i didn't really fully understand but i want to take you know we have people like that coming saying i did it but then i didn't fully understand that now i want to really do it you know uh, take part etc so we can avoid those kind of um, scenarios right? yeah yeah <clears throat> thank you so uh, once i went in like one place one family called me to come and visit in their home okay so i went to their home so i asked uh, when they did like when they believed jesus so they said it 2 uh, 3 before 2 3 years so i said did you took baptism or not so they were telling like pastor told us until god will not speak we will not give mm. so is it okay to make people they, uh, like for bait for baptism or communion like what mm. people do in my place yeah so i understand why someone would do that in the sense they just want to make sure they just want to make sure that the person is you know seriously following the lord and not just a you know just a trivial decision they don't they don't want them to you know go back and etc but scripturally if you look at it both in terms in terms of water baptism and sacraments we don't see such an instruction you know putting a time frame on people and saying that you know only after this time i'm going to watch we don't see that like we see philip you know baptizing the ethiopian eunuch he just he believed he was baptized same thing we see in cornelius house and people gathered they were baptized and so on so um, so there's no time frame according to scripture but it's good for us to teach them that we can do and make them understand and uh, you know lead them in taking part in baptism or sacraments of the lord's table so that is what it is yeah i know people do that you know just to make sure you know you must be you know walking in faith you must be you know walking in holiness and uh things like that but that's you know we don't see that in scripture yeah and so if you face a situation like that it's better to say okay you know not create confusion that's okay um, we can ask them to continue on and maybe have that conversation with their pastor if it is possible you know so yeah because if we yeah it's that's the thing other unnecessarily will be creating some kind of a friction between them and the pastor if we can address it with the pastor that will be great then yes yeah Mm. 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 <laughs> I know yeah I can't uh, that thing so it has to be a relational encounter with truth relational i mean i won't i'm just using the word encounter but it has to be a relational thing uh with truth and and definitely the lord will lead them to you know people whom they hold in high esteem like you know some other leader whom they are whom they receive from they are more open to receive from and uh, hopefully that will change things you know, when they receive this truth about from them then they'll change yeah yeah can we like as a part of church body like believer in one church we have certain customs uh -huh. and can some customs can we enforce on other believers who are not part of our church um uh, for example um, like, anything related to like what <laughs> 
<laughs> like uh, let me just go through i didn't see that okay so um specific to us should not be enforced on other believers elsewhere so the, it's talking about customs so it's talking about customs where okay you know we wear the shoes and walk in okay so is that something that a custom that you want to enforce on another believer so it's talking about customs so so some of those things that we do um so it's not the eternal truth it's a custom it does not matter it's a secondary thing so it's it's fine that um you know we give them the freedom give the other body of believers or the church the freedom to do it uh, like um, what are some things that we can do think about um uh maybe the time for worship maybe the time for you know how we do certain things um uh, during as as part of a service um like even when we are talking about worship ministry that's why you know kind of preface that by saying like you know in that particular you know we have this audition and all that so we always say okay if if it works in your context you no know, these are helpful things but how is it in your local church geographical setting demographic of people attending you know if it works you do it you know whatever is helpful for you you take that and use it so that way yeah okay so we'll take a break i think we have we have about 2 minutes um maybe we'll uh, yeah we'll just uh, look at chapter chapters 12 13 and 14 uh, it's about the the gifts of the spirit right uh, then 13 of course about the whole chapter on on agape love of god god's love and 14 again continuing with the gifts of the spirit so this is these are some things that we have already you know uh, read addressed but we'll quickly go through that and um, maybe you know most of us can share of what we have already learned in holy spirit class and all that right so yeah we'll take a break and then we'll come back mm-hmm.